In this video, we're going to open up Visual Studio and create our project and talk about the default project structure for ASP.NET MVC. So the first step is I'm going to jump down here, open up Visual Studio, and then once it loads... It's eventually. Loading. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I'm going to hit New Project. Now, the template that I'm going to be using is under Templates, Visual C Sharp, and Web. We'll see here um, that we have ASP.NET MT Web Application, Web Forms Application, MVC3 Application, MVC4 Application. We also have a couple others that we don't care about. The one that we're obviously going to be choosing is the ASP.NET MVC4 app Web Application. Although the Web Forms one does now make more sense. Right. Um, that, that's what you would use if you were using Web Forms on top of ASP.NET. Cool. Which again, you can still combine them. This is just the default template that is created. It just gives us some some files that we can use. All right. Um, also, make sure that you have .NET Framework 4.5 selected up here. So I'm going to select that. I'm going to type in simple blog, hit enter. And what we get is the basic uh, or the, the template chooser, I guess you could say. There's quite a few different templates we can use inside of ASP.NET MVC. We have empty. Now, that's the one we're going to be using. Empty basically makes a really, really empty ASP.NET MVC application. When I say really, really empty, I mean that the really the only things that are in it are the things that are absolutely required. Okay. Now, um, just to back up a second, it should be noted uh, as I was watching, you created simple blog, but you did go back and delete your previous folder for your... Uh, correct. I am not creating this over the Git repository that we created earlier. I deleted okay. that folder. All right. Okay, so we have empty, um, which again is a very, very empty application. We have basic. Basic's kind of nice. It gives us a few things automatically for us, things that we are actually going to be doing manually uh, because we want to explain what those things are. I guess is the best way to describe the reason why we're going with empty instead of basic. Okay. Then we have internet application. Internet application is going to give you an actual page that you can launch right after you create the template. It'll have authentication, so logging in and registering. It will have um, an about page, a home page, and so on. Then we have intranet. Intranet application is like internet application, except it uses Windows authentication instead of passwords and usernames. Now, the reason, you know, you know what an intranet is, right, Steve? Yeah, so this would be like an application you're building for your business to use. Yeah, for a corporate network. Yeah. Um, really, the only again, the only difference, though, is it uses Windows authentication. There's no reason why you couldn't create an internet application and just switch the authentication to Windows or create an empty application and add in Windows authentication. Gotcha. This just, it's just an easier way to get there. Right. Then we have mobile application. Um, same sort of stuff. It's just designed for more mobile things. Um, web API. This is what we were talking about earlier with the Web API. Um, remember, the Web API is another aspect of ASP.NET that we can use. Yep. Uh, we have SPA, or Single Page Application. A single page application is an application that has a single page. Pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> right. Um, it's Single page applications usually take advantage of JavaScript, client-side JavaScript frameworks. Um, if you were writing a, single, a Signal R application that was just like a chat service, you would probably want an SPA. Okay. Then we have Facebook application. That just <laughs> sets it up to be used. Facebook has become so pervasive, there it is. <laughs> okay, but we are going to be using empty. The next option we have is our view engine. We haven't really talked much about view engines, um, and we have two options. We have ASPX and Razor. Remember how WebForms was like the first thing built on ASP.NET to the point where ASP.NET and WebForms became synonymous? Yep. WebForms used a, um, a view type, a template type, called ASPX files. And those use a special syntax that allow you to generate HTML for your web application. The first few versions of ASP.NET MVC used ASPX files for its views. But they realized, they, they slowly started to realize that ASPX kind of sucked for ASP.NET MVC. It wasn't really appropriate. It was more appropriate for web forms than it was ASP.NET MVC. So then they created Razor in version 3. Razor itself isn't technically part of ASP.NET. 
it's actually a library that exists in isolation of it, but it plugs in very well into ASP.NET. And it's a view engine that is very, very awesome and very clean and is out of every language, platform, framework I've ever used, it is my favorite view engine. And um, we'll be taking a very good look at how Razor works in later videos. But we're definitely going to be using Razor. So even though I would have rightly picked Razor because it's a much cooler name, that's not really why we're going to use it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Um, I mean, ASPX, the reason it's called ASPX is that's the file extension for the views. It doesn't actually technically have a name. It's just called ASPX because that's the extension of the file names. Gotcha. Razor, the extensions are um, uh, CSHTML or VBHTML. Okay, cool. Now, we can also alternatively create a unit test project. We aren't going to be creating a unit test project. So let's go ahead and hit OK. Now, Vis Visual Studio is going to do a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Yeah, you um, got a pretty good computer, and it's really thinking. Yeah. Um, fortunately, I didn't. Uh, if I clicked on the, um, the basic or the, uh, the internet or intranet applications, it would have taken a lot longer to initialize. There's a reason for that, and I'm going to talk about that right now. The reason is if we open up our references on our project, we'll see we have references to a lot of things. Wow. Um, some of these, and this list will grow. This list will grow a lot. Um, some of these things like uh, uh, newtonsoft.json or uh, Microsoft Web Infrastructure, they are actually acquired in the form of a NuGet package. Now, if you aren't familiar with a NuGet package, a NuGet package is a way to manage packages for uh, C-sharp projects or any .NET project, really. They're a way to import external code into our projects and version them. So Visual Studio, when it created our project right here, our simple blog project, it pulled down a bunch of NuGet packages that it assumed we would need. In fact, ASP.NET itself is included as a NuGet package. Why do you think that's important, Steve? It, you know I can't stop thinking about candy bars now, right? <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I'm stuck on that. Please tell me, Nelson, because I'm on nougat. <laughs> well, it's in, it's important because it's it allows Microsoft to update ASP.NET MVC and its other components without requiring new versions of Visual Studio or new installers or anything else. It's really it, it's really cool because it allows us to update our stuff, um, or allows Microsoft to continuously improve ASP.NET. Okay, gotcha. Um, but there's a problem with it. And that is? That is, these projects are all, almost always going to be out of date when you start your project. So our first step after we've created our project is to update our NuGet packages. Okay. To do that, I'm going to right-click on References and go to Manage NuGet Packages. Inside of here, we'll have an Updates tab. And if I click on this, we see all the packages that are now out of date. You'll also notice that ASP.NET, the basic template, also pulled in Web API. Although we're not using it, it'll still be there. But whatever. Now, is it because these update really so quickly? They do these days. Yeah. Um, we see that MVC4 was updated last um, on the 30th of the fifth month, which is May. Um, no, yes, yes. Yes. Sorry, getting confused. Numbers, too many numbers. <laughs> but um, so yes, these are updated regularly, and we'll want to make sure they're all up to date. So to do that, we just hit the update all button. And we accept all the licenses without reading them. As we always do. <laughs> and then we wait. And we have updated all our packages. Sweet. So now we are fully up to date with for our simple blog. So now that we've done that, let's take a step back and look at what exactly this template is. Now, I assume that you guys are all C Sharp developers, so I won't talk about solutions and projects. But what the simple blog project is, is it's an ASP.NET application. But somehow it gets connected into ASP.NET MVC. And we'll talk about how that happens very shortly. So we see that we have a couple folders already created for us. These folders would be more populated if we had chosen a different template. We have our app data folder where we can place uh, databases that live on the file system, which we aren't going to do. We have our app start folder. Our app start folder contains three 
classes are filter config, our route config, and our web API config. Now we're going to ignore web API because we're not using it in this project. So we're mainly going to focus on route config and filter config. These are basically classes that have public static methods um, that are actually not really tied into ASP.NET MVC at all. These are just this is just a convenience to place these methods that perform our configuration inside of static classes. We'll actually be able to see where this method is invoked um, inside of our own code. But it's important to understand that because Visual Studio made these three files for us, doesn't mean they're anything special to do with the framework. Instead, this is a convention that you can do, you can change to whatever you want. You can change the name of this class, you can change the name of this method, you can move it wherever you want, as long as you invoke it somewhere. We'll, we'll see where it gets invoked very shortly. They're just trying to make life a little easier. Right. And it really does. I, I rarely change how the, these are organized. So we have routes and filters. We'll, we'll be talking about routes and filters, obviously, in the series, because they're very fundamental for ASP on an MVC, but they're not important for the structure of the project. Okay. Next up, we have these three folders. What do you think these three folders do, Steve? Well, look, it's MVC. It's the models and views and controllers that we talked about earlier. Right. These are your three buckets. So you have your controllers, your models, and your views. It's important to understand, again, these are conventions, and the conventions can be overridden. There is actually, the views folder is kind of special but we can override it anyway. Uh, you don't want to rename this folder unless you know where else to rename it because otherwise things will break. Okay. But the controllers and models folders, there's absolutely nothing special about them. They're just folders. Um, we could, in theory, put all of our models in our controllers folder and all our controllers in our models folder and then rename them and move them around. It doesn't make a single bit of difference. This is in contrast to other frameworks, especially frameworks in PHP, where the directory structure of your project is assumed by the framework. In ASP.NET MVC, that isn't the case. We have a lot of flexibility about how we organize things, despite the fact that there are some conventions which are good to follow. So that's one of the reasons we like ASP is because you have all that flexibility. It's one of the reasons to like it, and it's one of the reasons to hate it. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk about more of that um, very soon. So we have our controllers and models, and then we have our views. Inside of our views, we have our web.config file, um, one of our web.config files. This is important. We'll talk more about this later. Don't delete it. Next up, we have two of the most important files in this entire project, global.asics or asacs and web.config. Our packages.config file, if you're familiar with uh, NuGet, is just a file that's created by NuGet to tell NuGet what packages we have dependencies on. So you can ignore that. That's all managed for you automatically. Just don't delete it. But our global and web.config are important. Now, wait a minute. Open up the views tab again. Is that the same file? Nope. This is a different web config. This config is uh, basically, this config instructs any files to be placed in this folder to be treated as razor views. Okay. This web config, on the other hand, is the global configuration for our entire project. We have our app settings. We have things like our system web here and our handlers and so on and so on. We'll be using this file quite a bit in order to add things like database connections and other things. The web.config is important because it describes to the web server how our project is going to be ran. For example, we'll see that we tell it to use the 4.5.NET framework. We tell it to be in debug mode. We tell it to um, do some stuff with validation. And if I expand this, we'll see that we also tell it to register specific handlers into IIS to know how to talk to our project. So is this a place where it's pretty easy to break things if you don't be careful? Uh, yes. Okay. If this file is in any way invalid, no page on your entire website will work. There you go. But yes, we will be using this uh, later. This is where your configuration goes. You'll notice that it also expands into a web debug and web release. We will be talking about these in the last section of this video series because they have to do with deployment. 
So next up, we have our global ASAX. Our global ASAX is actually two files, but Visual Studio kind of combines it into one for us for visual purposes. And when we double click on it, we get global ASAX C sharp or dot C, uh, CS, sorry, um, this one. When we double click on this, we actually are getting this file. Okay. In fact, I know this is confusing, so let me um, let me show you guys what it looks like on the file system. We have our uh, global ASAX and our global ASAX CS, right? Yep. When we double click on global ASAX, we actually load up, as you can see up here, global ASAX CS. However, if you wanted to see the actual global ASAX, you right click on this and go to view markup, and you'll see this. Basically, the global ASAX is the entry point into web applications that are written on top of ASP.NET. The global ASAX file or class is used to handle things like application startup, application errors, request start, request end, and all that fun stuff. Which means if you need to do anything when your application starts, you put it in your global ASAX. As you can see here, remember how I told you those three file about those three files, the filter config, route config, web API config? Yeah. You see that basically all the application start is doing is it's invoking these three methods. If I were to take all of the code in route config and literally cut it and paste it right into here, it would or right into here, it would have the same effect. All we're doing is we're delegating off into these other classes so they're better organized. Gotcha. So remember, these files are invoked at application start. Okay, so here's another thing. So this is the MVC application. Um, it's just a class that inherits from HTTP application. And what happens is, is that when ASP.NET tries to load our program, it, lo it looks at our global ASAX, looks for the application declaration. It sees that we have a code behind, which is a term that has been very much outdated. Um, well, it's, it's not been outdated. It's something that you'd see a lot in ASP.NET web forms. I'm not exactly going to talk about what that means. The important thing that we'll see, though, is it inherits from our simple blog.mvc application, which is our class that we have right here. So that means that when ASP.NET or IIS loads up this file, it knows to launch this file, which then does its thing. Yeah, it tells it to go look at those three files. Right. Okay. So we have our MVC application, and um, it's in, there's a couple important notes to make about this class. First of all, you may have more than one instantiations of this class running in your program. Do not assume that because you have an instance member or an instance field on this class that is only going to be made once. Never assume that there is only one of these. Second, you'll notice that we have application underscore start. But this is not a override. This is not inheriting from an interface. In fact, this is doing exactly what Unity does, which irritates me. Um, it's just a magic method that has a special name that is loaded by uh, ASP.NET. Okay. So because it has the name application start, it will be magically invoked by ASP.NET. Now, I did say that this class may be instantiated more than once during the lifetime of your application. Application start will only ever be invoked once when the application starts. So again, do not store instance fields on this class. And we'll talk more about what that or We'll talk more about that later uh, once we start looking at in hibernate because at this point we don't have any reason to have any fields on this class Alrighty then so that's basically a, a really quick rundown of this application um, you'll notice some interesting things you remember how earlier I said you know there are pros and cons to ASP.NET's or MVC's uh, the way it does things yep this I wanted to wait until this point to actually go over something important. And that is that ASP.NET is not very opinionated. That is in stark contrast to frameworks like Rails or Django, which are very opinionated. What I mean by opinionated is that ASP.NET actually, or ASP.NET MVC, does not out of the gate give you a full stack. It doesn't really, it doesn't include database access by default. 
Um, I think some of the templates might have some stuff built in, but we're not using that. So uh, we're just I'm just talking about what ASP.NET MVC itself provides, not necessarily what templates would provide. It doesn't provide database access. It doesn't provide a lot of features that you, you kind of would grow to expect out of a web framework. That's a good thing, and it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing because it makes it very difficult for, for new users of the framework to really understand what's going on, because now they're expected to go out and pick libraries and other frameworks to plug in to ASP.NET MVC to make work the way they want it to. But it's a good thing because we have that flexibility. We're not locked down to a specific ORM. We're not locked down to a specific, a specific anything. ASP.NET MVC's sole purpose is a way to provide application logic that gets executed on a web server using the MVC pattern. It's not a way to provide a database access or anything like that. So it's important to understand that this template is very anemic. It doesn't have a lot of stuff in it. Like many things, all of that flexibility comes at the cost of you having to plug all these things in yourself. Right, which makes it very difficult for people who are new to the framework, which is one of the goals I have with this particular series, um, to, to introduce the tools that we can use in order to make ASP.NET MVC into our full stack that we can use okay. to build applications. Awesome. So I think that pretty much just wraps up our uh, basic introduction to the project structure of ASP.NET. Hopefully things are a little bit less scary now. Well, I mean, really, it's uh, it's set up in a pretty logical format. So. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. So we'll see you guys in the next video.